Singapore recently tabled a new bill in Parliament, known as the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Bill. If passed, it will give the government tools to counter falsehoods online. I'm here with Minister for Law and Home Affairs, K. Shanmugam. Minister Shanmugam, thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, the issue that we have to talk about, uh, the new laws that the government has tabled, um, the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Bill, also what you have called POFMA, uh, that you introduced on uh, April 1st. It's quite clear that most people understand the need uh, for all governments to address online falsehoods, especially deliberate and malicious falsehoods. The question is obviously how. Um, so let's start at the heart of quite a few of the public comments that have emerged since April 1st. And the first question obviously is why have you chosen for it to be ministers to be first point uh, of decision for various things on what constitutes a falsehood, uh, that there are grounds for action and that is in public interest and then deciding on the appropriate action. When there is a falsehood which affects public interest, it can s spread very fast, very quickly. I can give you actual incidents in Myanmar, an allegation that two Muslim men raped a Buddhist woman spread within 24 hours and within that time period you had people being killed, lots of rioters on the streets, buildings being damaged, a huge amount of public disorder. If you turn to the financial markets, actual example, a falsehood that a founder of a Bitcoin company had died. It's put out deliberately by somebody, I think, seeking to profit. Within a period of four to five hours, billions of dollars wiped out from the value. Lots of innocent investors lose money. Likewise, in Indonesia, a false allegation that a Chinese woman had um, criticized, said nasty things about a mosque. Within 24 to 36 hours, Buildings damaged, 12 Buddhist temples vandalized, lots of public disorder, you know, real fear for people's lives. These are real world consequences and it just doesn't happen in Asia, in Germany too, in many parts of Europe. So falsehoods spread like wildfire, they spread very quickly. The consequences will have to be dealt with by governments. So you need to move quickly. Therefore, ministers, are given the power or proposed to be given the power you know is it false and if it's false clarify you move in immediately to say clarify this this is not true it's false but you know we're only talking about facts not opinions not satire not parody not comments direct allegations did a rape take place uh, was this said or was it not said about a mosque by this person direct factual allegations which have impact on the public and uh, ministers you know call that and you put out a clarification together with the original article except that in some cases the original article may have to be taken down and if the person who is required to carry a clarification or take down is not happy he appeals to court so, so the, the examples that you've raised, public security, finance, financial issues, those are obviously very different issues and there will be varying issues that the ministers will have to raise yes. when, when they have the option to. But how then do you guard against or at least mitigate differing ministers having different approaches, uh, different thresholds to decide on what needs to be taken action on and what may be different type of action needs I to be taken? i give you an example from Singapore. I think many people will remember somebody put up a false photo, Pongol HDB roof collapsed. You know how many young families are living there and uh, people will be concerned. SCDF, police, assets rushed onto the scene. If we had the power to immediately clarify this is false and require the person and the platforms to push out a notice to everybody. Those of you who have read this article, please note the government has clarified that there is no roof collapse. Would it not be better if there is an allegation, oh, if you take this uh, vaccine, your child is going to uh, become autistic or it's going to get measles. You want the Ministry of Health to be able to put out a clarification and get it carried in the platforms that is carrying the untruth. 
So that's what this is about. Different ministries will have the expertise in different areas. And we are talking about clear facts. And uh, that will then have to be put through a competent authority, which will serve the notification. And as we have said uh, quite frequently, what would be required is for the tech platforms to carry the clarifications and push it out to the people who have received uh, notice of the faults. For most people, there is no impact. They just receive the notifications. You, you mentioned the competent authority. We're wondering also what room is there or are there uh, allowances in place for the competent authority since you raised the issue of uh, the HDB block or vaccines. Is that iterative process between authorities and the minister before a decision is made? It may have to be done fast, it may have to be done quickly, but is that that uh, balance as well that, that, that can be found? Uh, truth is not malleable. You know, either something is true or it is not true. Uh, but the competent authority could obviously offer its views to the minister on uh, what needs to be done, uh, follow up consequences. But the decision ultimately will have to be that of the minister. Now, another issue which has gotten the uh, sort of imagination of a few critics is the issue about exemptions. And, and there is a clause in the legislation that says the minister may exempt, and if I, re if I were to read this out, may exempt any person or class of persons from any provision of this act. Now, who, who does the law have in mind here? Obviously, when people see exemptions, for, especially for something as serious as this, they're saying, what is going on? Is there an issue <laughs> here? How would you explain that? It's, uh, it's because most people, understandably, don't realize that this is a fairly common provision in many pieces of legislation. Offhand, I can tell you 15, 20 pieces of legislation. There must be more. Let me give you a few examples. Now, if you take the Executive Condominium Housing Schemes Act or the uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine Practitioners Act, Active Mobility Act, Casino Control Act, Telecoms Act, Postal Services Act, the Remote Gambling Act, uh, Smoking Prohibitions in Certain Places Act, uh, Dangerous uh, Fireworks Act, broad variety of legislation has got similar provision. And the reason is uh, simple. Say the there is a request for a tech platform to carry a clarification or you know push out clarifications and uh, it's not technically possible to do some part of it then you know the minister will have to consider whether it is uh, true whether it is not possible and if so there's a you know, he could consider giving exemptions. That's all that this is about. Okay. I mean, the, the, the good thing that you raised those examples of exist, uh, existing use in, in different legislations because obviously people have come to trust that it would not be misused in, in all those things that, that you, have, you have raised and you've listed. So the question is then there's some suspicion that it could be here and if there's reassurance that they will not be misused, then that's obviously helpful. You know, any government that misuses uh, its powers will face the consequences. In terms of having this provision in this legislation, it's no different from a variety of other legislation. Another question, if I may then say about this, this particular portion that deals with the minister's actions, is that before someone can appeal or at least bring his case to the courts, he has to first send it to the minister as well. Yes. So the minister himself has to judge that first appeal to the yes. minister. That's can, again can, very normal. But can you explain that and, and is there any uh, room to mandate at least some degree of speed and efficiency? Oh, that will minister... be done. It's just that it's not normal to set these things out in the primary legislation. Uh, I will certainly deal with it during uh, the uh, second reading in mm -hmm. Parliament okay. and uh, set it out in subsidiary legislation. The whole approach will be to make it speedy, efficient, quick and uh, as inexpensive as possible. Another issue which uh, has sort of carried over from the select committee process that was last year was the suggestion by some people uh, to have a separate body, not the ministers, a separate independent body or any sort of body that could be maybe even uh, accountable to parliament to right. do that fact checking. Can you explain why that wasn't seen as... We, con as, we considered as, uh, it very carefully a number of reasons. As I said earlier, you need to move immediately, sometimes within a matter of minutes, sometimes within a matter of hours. And uh, the people best placed to make those decisions are the people who have to deal with the ground situation. That's usually the government, the executive. Second, 
the executive, the minister's government is accountable in parliament, they have to answer questions in parliament, and also accountable to the courts, where, you know, if a person who receives a notice to clarify something, is not happy, he doesn't want to carry the clarification. He may be a great believer in free speech, but he doesn't want to carry the other side. He can go to court, and the courts will then decide whether the minister will, was right or wrong in saying that something was not true. And you know, we are just dealing with a very basic thing. Is something true, something not true? Is the color of this table white or is it black? It's, it's factual. We are not dealing with opinions here. Opinions people can have, but you know, we are dealing with facts. The third point is ultimately, the government is accountable to the electorate itself. And so it stands or falls by its judgments. The, I mean, one of the, I suppose, attractive things about an independent or however independent it can who be... Who appoints that body? ...is one who's appointed, but also at least it sort of uh, minimizes the politicization of the final decision as well, because, uh, I mean, frankly speaking, if a minister, an appointed uh, minister, makes that decision, there's always some degree of political sensitivity and politicization into the, the decision that will be made. The benefit in having the fact-checking body is that it will be seen at least slightly more independently. I think the answer relies in coming back to actual concrete examples. Let's look at the Pongol example. Roof of a HTV block has collapsed. What is political about it? It's either the roof has collapsed or it hasn't collapsed. The Myanmarese example, either two Muslim men raped a Buddhist woman or they didn't. So these are facts. I don't think we need to go into politicization. And the consequences have to be faced by the government acting in the best interest of the people. If there are riots, if there is deep divisions, or if there is a serious public inconvenience in that you know people actually think there's a fire that has broken out, or their building has collapsed, stuff like that, then it falls on the government to deal with it. The government is best placed. What we are talking about is setting out a clarification sometimes a takedown and I don't see why this needs to be politicized. This is a exercise of government power just like the exercise of so many other government powers. Powers of arrest, powers of detention, powers of investigation, powers to run the economy, spend billions of dollars, put out the truth. Well since, since you mentioned that you raised the example of the Pongo apartments, yes. I mean that, that honestly uh, we, the media, will also feel that that is what we, our, our role is as well. Uh, yes. in that, and that's precisely something which the media could have, and actually exactly. some of us probably did, go out and actually verify that it did so not happen. So there is nothing wrong, but is there anything wrong in the government coming in with a further clarification? It helps. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's I'm, no reason why that and, and we did seek we did seek that clarification. The yeah. question then whether or not in certain cases you may not need the legislative. I have asked uh, in every section session that I attended, including with journalists mm. and others, uh, bloggers, people who do these things day to day, some day to day for a living. Mm. Give me one example of uh, a fact uh, versus falsehood that you think doesn't need to be corrected in this context, and I said I will amend the legislation. Not one person has pointed out. Each of the examples I give from around the world and in Singapore, they say, oh, but that's, we agree that power should be exercised. That is the point. The power needs to be exercised. Now, another issue which I think uh, needs some uh, addressing is, is the role of the courts. We sort of touched upon that a little bit right. earlier. Uh, and as you've said, since uh, April 1st, that the court will be the final arbiter. Uh, and that's as, what the bill provides. Um, and you've also said in recent days that you must and you will prescribe timelines and even costs to keep the process, and as you said just now, uh, as efficient as possible. Yes. Now, would you therefore then admit that there was some uh, uh, sort of understandable concerns from people when they saw that the appeals process had to go to the courts, it would be expensive, it would take a long time? I can understand people's concerns. But in terms of our thinking, that has always been our thinking. You know, a lot of people don't realize, but in addition to this bill, there is another bill to amend the Protection from Harassment Act. That gives individuals broadly similar powers. A lot of people don't realize. You know, people get harassed, people get uh, lies said about them, and they are given powers now to 
go to court, get an application, get the falsehoods taken down or correct it. Because why should their individual reputations be tarnished? So individuals are now going to be empowered under protection from Harassment Act. And I said some months ago that it's my intention to make it as inexpensive as possible, streamline the process, make it efficient, make it fast, make it speedy. In fact, uh, set up specialized courts which will deal with it. And you, will, and you set this up in the second reading, you will, you will clarify this? Wait, uh, so I had said that about POHA. And uh, you don't set those things out in the legislation. And it was precisely my intention, whatever I said a few months ago, for POHA, and POHA and POFMA are being put in at the same time, it has always been our intention that similar th uh, sort of a pr process. Pr process and mm. prescription would be put in place for the uh, protection from manipulations and falsehoods. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, something that we haven't thought about. Okay. I can understand people being concerned, but mm. we've already taken care of that in terms of our thinking. Okay. And I'll make it clear during the second reading. Okay. Um, another issue which I, I, I think needs clarified is that within the legislation that you put on the table, the judge's ability to act and yes. the grounds on which they can uh, decide are sort of, some would say, circumscribed into two areas. One, to decide whether or not it is true or it's actually still false, right. and also whether or not it's technically feasible. Yes. Uh, some have said, why shouldn't the judges be in a position to also decide uh, whether a takedown is disproportionate, maybe a correction is needed? Or they can decide. Um, it follows established law. Whether it's true or false, it's a straightforward question, and uh, the judges decide that. Technical feasibility is also a question they decide. When it comes to what is public, what is in public, public interest, interest yes. and what is the right remedy, those are based on previous case law, based on established precedent, matters for the executive, and the courts intervene in certain circumstances. And they've set out in law how they will intervene, in what circumstances they will intervene. That's not being disturbed by this legislation. So that there is even if it may not There may transpire. be a difference in standards in the exactly. way uh, in terms of how they will intervene or the standards they apply to intervene. As, as I said, that's set out in law. Not, uh, this legislation doesn't change the law. If we can now take a step sort of back yeah, and right. look at it from a big picture perspective, um, the ordinary citizen looks yes. at this uh, legislation. Some may understand it more, some may understand it less. Uh, and then they'll hear international criticisms, they'll see, see criticisms from other people. Obviously, the, the main concern that they'll have is free speech. How, yes. does it, how does it firstly affect their own ability to speak, uh, to criticize, to critique, to comment? That's one. The second point is how does it then also affect their access to what they see as free speech? Will it constrain their access to contrarian views, different views? Yes. Um, and, and that there is some groundswell of concern there. Is, is, right. is that something that you can respond to? First thing, in uh, all the different meetings that I, my colleagues, my officials have had and in the various soundings we have taken reaching out to lots of people, I think by and large people understand. And I would say there are concerns, but that's uh, restricted to a smaller group. Uh, so that's the first point, but that's not to minimize the concerns. Right? But uh, we get the sort of sense of what people are concerned about. Uh, so for the people who are engaging us, those who have concerns, uh, my message has been very simple and I've said it publicly. 99% of the people don't have to worry about what they do 99% of the time. What do I mean? Most of us receive messages. We share them. Uh, we forward them. Uh, people like them. None of that is an issue. And if it turns out to be false, the primary approach is to ask the tech platforms to put up a clarification that's pushed to everyone. So for most of us, the day after this bill becomes law, you know, assuming Parliament passes it, life carries on as per normal. The people who need to be concerned are the people who profit from and peddle in falsehoods. They put out knowing that it's false, and they know that they are going to profit from it. They are, going, they are doing it deliberately. They are setting it out. Uh, there is some element of malice. Yeah, they need to worry. But, as I said, most people don't fall in that category. They may be passing on falsehoods, mm -hmm. but uh, they are not the creators of it. They don't know that it's false. They're just passing it on. Nothing changes for them.
they will receive now, and I'm sure they'll be happy to receive, many of them, a notice uh, saying that actually if you want to know the truth, go to such a, such a place. If, if I may close off again with another even bigger picture, even longer term question, in that you set out the legislation and obviously some have criticized it for being way too broad, uh, provides the government too much power, but you've, you've, you've explained at least now the way in which it will be implemented, the policies of implementation, how it will be conscribed and how it's meant to be implemented. But some may argue also, of course, that you, you, it, this is the current government. There's nothing to prevent a future government uh, from using the provisions within that legislation to abuse it. Uh, and we've seen examples of this everywhere. It's not just individuals who proffer falsehoods. Certain governments, if I may say so, also quite liberally use falsehoods. Um, so and those uh, governments will face the consequences at the elections. Um, so, so, I mean, is, is that something that you, you think uh, can be looked at within the legislation that there are inbuilt sort of checks that it can include to preclude that kind well, of Well, first abuse. of all, there are checks. If uh, there is a declaration that something is false, the state, you know, asking for clarification, the courts have oversight over it. So there is a clear oversight mechanism, checks. Second, you are talking about future governments, whether they will abuse. You know, Singapore government, in terms of other legislation, has also been accused of having too much power. We have always said, okay, what works for us, we put it in place, and we exercise those powers honestly, and we allow ourselves to be judged, and every uh, periodically, the people judge us at the elections. And they look at the results of what we have done. There are pluses, minuses, bottom line, how does it work? So that's the way a transparent government has got to work. I cannot vouch for how a future government will act, but there is a serious problem. Falsehoods are the new currency that a lot of people trade in. It has got serious consequences for people in terms of blood, in terms of money, in terms of lives, and uh, it is wrong for the Singapore government to keep quiet. You see legislation in Germany. You see Australia passed its legislation in two days. Britain has proposed very sweeping changes, not yet into legislation. And we had extensive hearings last year. We heard a lot of evidence. It's a serious problem. Everybody accepts that it's a problem. We've got to do something about it. Well, we, we certainly hope that we'll hear a little bit more about it when the bill comes for a second reading in Parliament in the coming yes. weeks. Uh, thank you so much for giving us the time. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you.